Thank you so much. It is so much fun to be back here. And um, I hate to start off being all sappy and sentimental right off the bat, but I'm going to. Um, the title kind of lends itself to things like this, so forgive me. But many of my reasons to be happy are in this room here with me, and I can't help but stop a moment and say a few things about them. Um, my parents are here, and um, my mom has never missed a single local signing of mine. And there were lots of things conspiring against her being here tonight, and she is here, and that makes me very happy. So. And my wonderful sister, who is one of my biggest inspirations, Monica, is here with her husband, Rick, and my amazing niece and nephew, Amy and Nathan. And Nathan said I couldn't point him out, so I'm not going to. Um, but I just want to tell you all that someday you're going to be here for book signings for Amy and Nathan, because... Amy's already an amazing writer, and they both are incredible storytellers, and trust me, we'll, we'll be here for their books in a, in a few decades, perhaps. <laughs> and um, this was kind of a rough summer for me. Um, I'm not going to get all model and melodramatic, I promise, but um, I had a little uh, a, a health crisis, probably the worst one of my life, and, um, and it was kind of rough, and there was, you know, in times that are of trouble, you really find out who your friends are, and I already knew. I had an amazing tribe of friends, but it was just such an affirmation and validation of the fact that I am so lucky and so blessed and so many people took care of me and supported me were amazing and most of them were here right now. So thank you to my tribe. They are definitely a big old reason to be happy. And also to all the, all the you people, Sharon, all the booksellers here, so many people, um, those of you I don't know personally who have supported me on this writing journey and support the books and are here for events like this, so I thank you very much. What I thought I would do tonight um, is tell you a little bit about the book, read a little short passage, and then my very, very favorite part is always the question-answer section. And with a brand new book, that is always a little um, terrifying but fun in the sense of it's like a theatrical improv because I haven't told these stories 500 times already. This afternoon was the first time I was doing question and answer about it with a middle school group. So I have no idea what you might ask, and that's kind of fun, because with some of the other books, it's all, I, I know there's people in the audience who could probably answer the questions for me because they've heard those stories so many times. But um, this is all new, so we'll finish with my favorite part of the um, question and answers. But the basic plot of Reasons to be Happy, it is about Hannah Ann Carlisle, who is in eighth grade, and she is the daughter of A-list Hollywood celebrities. Her parents are big time movie stars. And she is really having some trouble. They, um, they've moved. She's now in a new school. She's been embraced by um, a group of friends that she's not quite sure about. And the embrace begins to feel like being held hostage. She doesn't like who she is with them. Her mother is terminally ill. Her father is hugely distracted with his own issues. Things just keep getting worse and worse. She's having a very, very bad year. Um, thematically, this is a story about a girl who kind of loses herself, but recognizes that she's lost herself and has the fight and the pluck in her to struggle and find her way back. Um, and those of you who have read some of my adult books, you probably know, you probably think that storyline might sound a little familiar. Because I've come to realize, I've not done it on purpose, but I have come to realize that every single one of my books, including this one, sort of shares the same theme. I keep returning to the same stories, and they're all sort of based on my favorite quote. I love quotes, but my very, very favorite one in the whole world is from Ernest Hemingway, of all people. But um, he says, the world breaks everyone, and afterwards, some are strong at the broken places. And I love that. And I think I, my, all of my books kind of focus on that idea of strong at the broken places. I love stories about second chances. I love stories about comebacks. I love the Phoenix story. And, and so I think all of my books are variations on that theme, including this one. Now, it looks like most of our audience is adults tonight, but that's OK. Um, raise your hand if you happen to be in middle school right now. OK, so we have, we have a few. OK, all right, so you adults. Raise your hand, adults, if you would go back and repeat middle school, if you could. <laughs> wow. I see a couple hands, but not many. OK. Raise your hand if you remember middle school as being a pretty horrific time of your life. <laughs> OK. 
well, I taught middle school for six years. I taught high school before that, but for six years I taught middle school, and I contend that you can walk into a middle school classroom and smell the angst <laughs> and smell the hormones. And um, it's a really hard time. It's a time, and part of why I loved it so much is I loved them because I remembered how hard it was. Um, it's probably, other than being an infant or being in the womb, it is probably the time of your greatest development at any point in your human life. It is a time of huge change, emotionally, physically, maturity-wise, all of that. And change, as we all know, is hard. Nobody likes it, even though it makes us better. Um, change can be really confusing, change can be really chaotic, and so when that much of it is happening all at once during those years, it's easy to get lost. And that's what I started to, to realize during those six years that I was a teacher, I would see this thing happen over and over again, of people, particularly the young women, getting lost. It was, it was like a time of an identity crisis. And what would happen is these girls would come in as sixth graders and be these bold, fierce, enthusiastic, curious, human beings and something would start to shift and they would suddenly these things that they were so enthusiastic about they would fall away because everything became about approval seeking and fitting in and being like a clone of everyone else and they would all and not this is not true of everyone but a majority would all start to dress alike and do their hair alike and even talk alike and and it was so disheartening to see this happen over and over again I told a story this afternoon of like, one of my very, very favorite students. We, we always go to this place called Camp Joy that the teachers have another name for. <laughs> but the eighth graders get to climb this cool alpine tower, and I had this student who loved to rock climb. She was a climber. She was awesome. She was great and athletic. And her eighth grade year when we're at, at Camp Joy, she had two of her best friends didn't want to climb, so she sat on the ground and didn't climb the Alpine Tower, and I was so mad at her. And it was the thing about they didn't want to, so she wouldn't do this thing that I knew she would love. And that's what I would see happen over and over again. So that became my issue for this book. All of my books kind of center around a social issue, um, and that's kind of what I start with. And for that one, it became that, that idea of that, that losing yourself. Um, and, and finding your way back. And why do so many girls go through that? And why did some of them not go through it? And I was very lucky at MBS because it's such a tiny campus that the, the upper school is right up the hallway. So these girls who sort of got lost, I would see them as sophomores and realize they made their way through it. But why did they have to do it at all? I got really curious about that and exploring that. And I know I did it too. So that was my issue for this book. And part of why I ventured into young adult finally, after all this time, you know, my students at MBS would always ask me, when are you going to write a book we're allowed to read? And, um, <laughs> And I would tease them and say, I'm so slow that by the time I write it, you won't want to read it. And that's exactly what happened today. It's like all my former students are now like seniors, and they were all like, oh, hi, what are you doing here? I'm like, I have a book. <laughs> um, but, you know, they all read Blessings last year. But, um, but I got this whole new audience of middle schoolers. But what made me kind of start on this path initially, besides their kind of poking and prodding at me to read something, to write something they were allowed to read, was I got the most amazing letter out of the blue from an editor who's not my editor, named Sharon November at Viking. And she's the editor for Laurie Hall Sanderson, who's one of my favorite, favorite young adult writers. Um, she's got some rock star clients, you know, this editor does. And she wrote to me after The Kindness of Strangers. And, it, and some of you have read that, and you know that there's three narrators. One's a 10-year-old boy, one's a 17-year-old boy, and one's an adult woman. And Sharon November wrote to me and said, I love the boys' voices in this book. Have you, I think you write young people very well. Have you ever considered doing young adult um, work? And at that time, I hadn't. And we struck up an email correspondence. We've been emailing now for years, since 2006. And she's always encouraged me. And I like to tell that story just because I think that's important for us to know our influence on people. That just something like that, this letter that came out of the blue, started me off on this whole new thing where here I'm standing in front of you with a new book and I probably wouldn't be here if it weren't for that letter. So it's, it's important for us not to forget the effect that we can have on others with that kind of support and encouragement. So I started writing this um, and it was actually, it, this is a complicated story, but in, at one point Blessings of the Animals was a big old mess. That was my recent, most recent book. And it was, and those of you who are writers in the audience will relate to this, when you're working on a story and it's, it's, you've completely lost control of it and it just keeps getting longer and longer and the end is nowhere in sight and you're not even sure what it's about. <laughs> um, and my agent called me one day and was like, um, we're approaching a deadline, how is that book going? 
And I said, it's about too many things and it's too long. And she goes, Let, send me 100 pages. And I made up some excuse about, well, I can't really get to the post office because there's snow. And she's like, email me 100 pages. <laughs> so I did. And she read it. And she was really amazing, as she always is. At, she read it that day and, and got back to me and said, you're right. This is about too many things. This is really two books. And she was really good at extricating the two plots from each other. And one of the plots is what became Reasons to be Happy. And you know, she kind of ripped them apart for me and said, this is too much to be happening to this daughter. Hannah was very much Gabriella in Blessings of the Animals. And I was having way too much happen to Gabriella. Instead of it being her mom's story, it was spreading into this giant headed thing. And um, so this girl got shelved for a long time. And Gabriella became a much more simplified character. And I've never done this before. As a writer, I delete characters all the time. I kill them off. I, and I save everything. But I never have used anything that I cut. I always save it thinking that maybe someday, or at least it's good to have a record to see where you've come from. But I have never actually used that material until this book. And that first year that I left full-time teaching, I was traveling around. And I, was, I remember I was in Brooklyn. And I was waiting for notes from my editor, who is notoriously slow, on Blessings of the Animals, and I knew it was going to be months. And so you have to have a project. You have to work on something. You can't just wait. I think writing is very much like a sport or studying dance or something like that, where if you don't keep working daily, you, you get out of shape. You lose the stamina that's required to do it. So I, I pulled out. I went to those computer files and was reading about all that stuff I had happening to Gabriella, and suddenly she became someone else. And I thought, she deserves her own book. And I started working on this. And, that, and one of the things I love, the beauty of the writing life, is that you get to use everything. Um, and it's the same is true of acting. I know there's lots of theater people here tonight, too. Um, everything that happens to you, everything you hear, everything you experience, even if it's horrible, even if it's boring and you never want to repeat it, you can use it. It all becomes material for stories. Um, and that gets you through a lot of things in life where you can be like, I can use this. You just keep telling yourself. <laughs> but things like, OK, I've been in middle school. Obviously, I was going to use that. But then also having taught middle school you know, with that distance and a little more experience, um, having seen some of the workings, I could use that. And because of teaching at MBS, I got to take um, this amazing trip to Ghana in West Africa. I got to visit Ghana, Togo, and Benin in West Africa. And that was a really life-altering experience. So this book. I use a lot of that Ghana stuff, and I've been waiting for years to be like, where can I use some of these things that happened to me? So this book is not only my first venture into young adult writing, it's the first book of mine that leaves Ohio. Um, all of my books have been placed in this area. Three are in Dayton, one is in Cincinnati. This book starts in Los Angeles. It comes briefly to Yellow Springs, Ohio, and then half of it is set in Ghana. And for instance, like one of my most memorable things in Ghana was visiting a voodoo market. So of course, Hannah goes to the voodoo market. Monkeys stole my sunglasses. Monkeys steal Hannah's sunglasses. <laughs> I got to buy kente cloth from the chief of the village of Bonwiri. I didn't know he was the chief until after we left. This beautiful old gentleman taught me how to barter, which I was terrified to do. There were no fixed prices, and I hated the bartering system. And he coached me through it, telling me that people would think I was stupid if I didn't learn how to do it. Um, if I just agreed to their, he said if I agreed to their first price, they would think that I was stupid. So he taught me how to do it. And I worked that story in. And this could be overshare, but this is to, so you know what's in the book. These are things that I knew that as they were happening, like as I said, you're like thinking to yourself, I can use this. I was once so desperate in Africa for a public bathroom, and there are few, that I peed in a grocery sack, <laughs> a plastic grocery sack. Um, Sometimes you have to be very resourceful. And then the best story from Africa was one night, honest to God, there was a goat under my bed. And I did not know that that goat was there when I tried to fall asleep. And, um, and I was so relieved when I'm like, I can finally use the goat story. So that's, like I said, the beauty of the writing life is these things as they're happening. You're like, OK, finally, here it comes. Then the title, um, come, this, this idea of the list, which gives us the title, was something that also came from MBS. Um, Hannah, the character, keeps a notebook and keeps a list of reasons to be happy. And that came about quite by accident in MBS one day when there was a huge snowstorm and we were the only school open in a 50 mile radius and people were very angry. <laughs> and um, only about half the student population was there and they were bitter and they were nasty. And it was already after lunch 
And I remember saying to somebody, I'm like, we're here. We're here already. It's been half a day. You have to let it go um, and just be happy. And he said, I have no reason to be happy. And I was like, oh, come on. You have re plenty of reasons to be happy. He's like, name one. And so then it turned into this thing. All right, everybody get out a piece of paper. And we, I made them list reasons to be happy. And of course, everybody's number one thing was snow days. <laughs> then I collected these lists. And some people took it very, very seriously and very heartfelt um, and wrote things like having a home, sleeping in a warm bed every night, never having experienced hunger. A sixth grader said that. You know Aww. what I mean? Think about that. We all say things like, oh, I'm starving, but mm, we never know what that feels like. And so that's a reason to be happy. And then some people, if they were stuck, I said, go for your senses. What are your favorite things to smell, your favorite things to hear, your favorite things to see and taste? Um, and so, you know, you got things like warm Krispy Kreme donuts or, you know, the aroma of freshly ground coffee beans. That's one of mine. I like that really thick syrup at the bottom of the snow cone, stuff like that. And I would um, collect the, I collected their list and I started putting a reason to be happy on the board every day. And um, they, they got really serious about it. Like if, if they came into first period and they're like, you haven't changed the reason, that's, that's yesterday's reason. I'm like, okay, and I would pull out the, the lists and find one. And um, if there was a sub, they would tell the sub, you have to change the reason to be happy. And the next day, the next year, on the first day of school, someone asked me, are we going to do that reason to be happy thing again? And I was like, yes, as a matter of fact, yes, yeah. that was my plan. You know? and, um, and, so, and so from day one, we started with no, day number one, and so they always knew what day of school it was. And if we were going to be gone for a break, I would list several for all the days. You know, it would be reasons to be happy 100 through 115, you know, and, and you would list them before winter break and stuff. But um, Hannah, in the book, she keeps a list, and it's kind of the anchor of the story, um, of her little notebook with her list, but her reasons aren't my reasons. And so I'd like to read here and just kind of re read the very opening chapter, which is very brief, so you hear the kind of things that she has on her list, and then I'll explain after the first chapter how that kind of evolves <laughs> through the book. Since this is the first chapter, um, I don't need to tell you anything about her. This is exactly how you would meet her if you were opening the novel yourself. Chapter one, reasons to be happy. Number one, swimming with dolphins. Number two, outrunning a forest fire. Number three, a hot air balloon ride. Four, seeing a shark fin while surfing but making it back to the shore intact. Five, hiking by moonlight. I used to be brave. What happened to the girl who wrote those things? The girl who left the house that morning all excited about her first day of eighth grade at a new school? That girl who got up way too early and flipped through her sequin purple notebook where she keeps a list of things that are good in life. Things like, number 20, the smell of band-aids. 21, cat purr vibrating through your skin. 22, hiking with dad up on Arroyo Seco and seeing a mountain lion at dusk. 23, vampires. 24, playing with the rubbery residue after you let glue dry on your fingers. How could so much change so fast in just one day? Scratch that stupid question. Besides, it wasn't really a day, it was a summer. How could they change so fast over one summer? Let's see, you could uh, move to a new school, be totally humiliated, have no real friends, your mom could get cancer, and oh yeah, you could have the most disgusting, embarrassing secret on the planet. Yeah, that about does it. That would explain the changes. So the harder question is, how do I get that girl back? That girl who saw so many reasons to be happy that she started to keep a list. Number six, making lists. Number seven, jumping on a trampoline in the rain. Number eight, ghost stories. Nine, painting your toenails. 10, winning a race. 11, dark chocolate melting in your mouth. 12, pad thai so spicy hot it makes your nose run. I missed that girl. She used to be bold and fun. Then she became a big chicken loser. There goes Hannah, Aunt Izzy used to say, jumping in with both feet. Aunt Izzy's my mom's sister. She lives in Ohio, where she and my mom grew up, in a funky purple house in this hippie town called Yellow Springs. Aunt Izzy's purple house is reason 28 on the list. Aunt Izzy makes documentary films. I know, I know, documentary films sounds boring, but she makes good ones. Her last one won an Academy Award. 
My mom and dad are actors. They've never won Academy Awards, even though both of them have been nominated. They make their living in feature films, which is why we live all the way in Los Angeles now. Aunt Izzy said, I jumped in with both feet like it was a compliment, like it was good and brave, which reminds me, running hurdles when you hit your stride just right is number 56. My mom, though, said I jump in with both feet like it's a very, very bad thing. You don't have any fear, she said with this look of exasperation. But that was before I became afraid of everything. I hesitated too long before I jumped. I waited, paralyzed, thinking of all the bad things that could happen until the moment was gone. It was like, once I stopped risking, I lost the ability. Like that day, my disaster of a first day. I hesitated too long. I let the wrong things gain momentum, and there was no way to stop the avalanche. And then, so that's chapter one, and chapter two begins with another portion of her list, and every chapter sort of opens with a section. Sometimes she goes back to a thing in her list, and sometimes there are new ones that she's just come up with. And the list changes as she changes, and you hit chapters where she has no reasons to list, um, and then once she hits Africa, the, the nature of things that make her happy start to change and evolve as, as we go on. So the big secret, I don't think it's a spoiler because you should begin to suspect fairly early in the book, her disgusting, embarrassing secret is bulimia. And I knew, uh, we were, I was worried because eating disorders have been dealt with a bazillion times in young adult literature, but not in tween literature. And there were three things that we thought, that we agreed upon that we thought gave it a twist and made it different, not just another eating sort of story. First of all, I don't think that's the issue in the book. The issue is the identity crisis, and she just happens to hurt herself this way. Some people choose cutting, some people do other self-destructive behaviors. But, um, so the first thing that we thought made it different was the younger age, and the, we, there was a government study recently that 40% that of nine-year-old girls had already dieted. And that was so disheartening to me. It's like the more we learn about body image and eating disorders, the more prevalent it becomes in a way. Um, also, a thing that I think this book deals with that not a lot of eating disorder books have is that it treats it like the real disorder that it is. It's very, eating disorder is very much like an addiction of any other kind. And unless you address what need that fulfills for the person who has it, you will never change the behavior. So, and eating disorders tend to be those disorders that people don't understand how complicated the psychology is, and they get very impatient and disdainful of girls who have them and say things like to an anorexic girl, why don't you just eat? It's easy. You know, but there's nothing easy about eating for someone with anorexia. That's like telling an alcoholic, why don't you just stop drinking? You know, it's not a question of just willpower. So there, there's a lot in the story, and there's a direct parallel to another character with a different sort of addiction. Um, that kind of shows that, that parallel going on. And then I think the biggest twist is the, switch, the shift to Ghana, that we take this bulimic from LA of all places and plunk her down in a third world country where she has no idea what is even considered beautiful, much less popular. And so her relationships and friendships become a much more pure and much more authentic um, because she has nothing else to base them on but that purity of the friendship. Um, and I think that is something that I've never seen in a book that dealt with this before. And again, I want to stress, just like with Kindness of Strangers, I had that problem of like people think this is a book about abuse. And I'm like, I don't think that's what it's about. I don't think this book is about bulimia. Um, I think it's about something bigger. But it's in there. And I love, you know, it came out October 1st, and I love that I've already gotten letters from young readers. And one thing that people are doing that I absolutely adore, without me coaching them to do it, is at the end of their letters, they will always say, here's my top five reasons to be happy. Mm -hmm. And they, so they're sharing their lists, and I'm pretty soon I'm gonna start putting them on, um, my, on my website. And I recently put up a Ghana photo album of some of the things that are in the book. Like, you can see the goat that was under my bed. You can see the monkeys who stole my sunglasses. <laughs> um, things like that. So these, these people are, are sending me their lists, which I just love. My most recent one, someone, one of their reasons was rubbing their cat the wrong way. And I realized as I'm reading her letter, I'm doing the exact same thing. <laughs> so I told her that. But um, since July 1st, I've been keeping a blog where I list a reason to be happy every day. And I'm going to have, um, ooh, I left them in my bag, which I gave to Lauren. So once we start signing books, Lauren will give me my bag back, I think. And um, I have postcards that have all my um, contact information for the blog and for Facebook and things like that. 
um, if you want to check out their Reasons to be Happy blog. We're on reason number 105 now, since July 1, and I said I would do this for a year. And um, somebody teased me the other day, because they were like, and I said, oh, I already have the list. And they're like, you're pre-happy? And I said, I'm pre-happy. Um, but one of the things, I think it's a great experiment, and I love the ripple effect that I've seen happen with, once I started the blog, some other people started doing it too, and I love that. Someone told me they were worried about copying, and I was like, no, I love it. This is the whole point. So if you're going to do it, here's two ways to think about it. And today, like, it's, this is too big of a group, but in these smaller groups I've been talking to, I've made everybody list a reason. Um, but you, you're off the hook. But um, it's a really great experiment. Think of it in two ways. Part of the reasons to be happy list is about gratitude. So for instance, I, one of my blogs, um, uh, the reason to be happy blog was being safe. It was a reason to be happy because one night listening to NPR, there was story after story about people living in these horrific circumstances and it struck me. I've lived my entire life never ever having to worry about being bombed when I go to school or go grocery shopping. I have never had to worry about being shot. I mean, briefly when we had that shooter in Columbus, but that was such a rare occurrence for us. Do you know what I mean? The percent, the, the chances of any of us being shot just going about our daily business is very low. I don't have to worry about my neighbors coming after me with machetes. On my way home from Books and Company tonight, I don't expect marauding bands of rebels to pull me out of my car and kill me. Um, and that's a reason to be happy, being safe, that we, live, we have the luxury of living in relative safety. So gratitude is one branch of the list. And the other branch of the list is just paying attention. Really pay attention to the sensory stuff, the random little things that make life really great. And if you start focusing on those things like that smell of freshly ground coffee, like rubbing a cat the wrong way, like Hannah on the back of the book has raw cookie dough, um, getting yourself all freaked out after a scary movie. Oh, and I dare, how many of you have not done this? Dancing like an idiot when no one is watching. <laughs> um, a sixth grade class today did this, and a few of the things they said that I loved. And you can see how it's all across the board. Um, having my mom and dad home from Afghanistan. Um, koala bears, huge eyes. I like that one. Um, wiggling a loose tooth. Walking on the beach, watching a family of dolphins jump. Warm sugar cookies straight from the oven. The fall smells of smoke, pumpkin pie, and hot chocolate. And getting an A on a difficult test. Stuff like that. So it's all about gratitude and paying attention. So I want to finish by reading to you my top 10 list that someone asked me for. And then we'll head into the question and answers, which I love. So now my number one thing is my amazing tribe of family and friends. Number two, my very odd, very fat, very dysfunctional cat, Joey. <laughs> Number three, my overflowing garden. Four, good, strong coffee with cream. Five, dark chocolate. Six, books. Seven, movies. I love, I can't imagine life without books or movies. Um, eight, zombie apocalypse stories in particular. <laughs> Nine, starting every morning in my writing office doing what I love most. And number 10 is goats even when they're under my bed. So